I'm going to talk into this. Oh, that's better, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to talk into this, and then maybe someone can come and show me which button to press on the thing on my hips. Um, so, this panel is about the um, emerging markets and how they are responding to the pandemic. And I'm going to start with a little thought, um, which is the speed at which this has happened is quite unprecedented. The speed at which the pandemic spread around the world. If you compare it, you know, go back to the, the Middle Ages when the bubonic plague was around. It took years and years and years for it to cover just Europe because it was moving around at the pace of an ox cart being pushed by a, a peasant who wasn't in any great hurry. Nowadays, the pandemic, the virus, the COVID-19 virus, spreads at the speed of aeroplanes and cars. And so it's spread all the way around the world uh, in a matter of weeks. And at the same time, the cure, the vaccination, was discovered with absolutely unprecedented speed. They managed to um, isolate the, the, the cause, figure out the genes of, of the virus, um, and come up with a vaccine all in less than a year. Whereas, you know, back in the Middle Ages, they had hundreds of years and never found out even what caused it. So we're having to respond to things much faster than we've ever had to in the past. Um, and to help us cope with that uh, extraordinary pace of change, I have four very wonderful panelists here today. Um, so joining us, first of all, live uh, here in Kiev, um, we have uh, Nicholas Timochuk, who is the Chief Executive Officer of UFuture, uh, and is also his company's sponsoring uh, the, the session. So thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for joining us, Nicholas. Um, we have uh, Dalia Marin, who is uh, an economist um, from the uh, Technical University of Munich, who's joining us. Um, so thank you for joining us, Dalia. And uh, joining us remotely, uh, you can see on the, the monitor somewhere, um, we have Alvaro Santos Pereira, who is a uh, the head of the Economics Department Country Studies branch at the OECD. Um, and we have Beata Harasim, who's the senior investment strategist of BlackRock Investments Institute. So thank you all very much for joining us. I hope you can all hear us fine. Um, let's jump in straight away with a question for Nicholas. Um, Nicholas, perhaps you could tell us um, whether you think that emerging markets are well poised to recover from the uh, the pandemic. Well, thank you for that. Well, first of all, you know, I think that we should, we're talking about the emerging markets. First thing that we should do is always separate everybody else and China, because it's like the joke of Bill Gates entering into the room and then everybody on average becomes a millionaire, right, in that room. The same when you, are, when you see emerging markets, performance and conditions packed with China, it really distorts the perception. If we're talking about emerging markets other than China, I think no, they are not well positioned for growth for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because COVID economically has actually exacerbated the gap between the developed world and the developing world. First of all, because of access to liquidity. What effectively happened is that developed nations, especially those with monopoly on hard currencies, printed as much money as they needed without effectively any risk of devaluation because relatively to what? They can devaluate only relatively to each other and, what, and if all of them are printing money, then, then only devaluate based on the on inflation. No developing nation can afford that. Secondly, because of the uh, um, attitude to debt. Effectively, what we have here is that debt standards, debt tolerance in the world has changed dramatically. Just over the COVID year, the cumulative debt of uh, to GDP of G20 countries has increased to 120%. Whereas, specifically to Ukraine, for example, IMF demands that we decrease public debt to GDP. So not, do not support your public spending during the pandemic. Do not support your business during the pandemic, but decrease your, your debt, both public and corporate. And this is diametrically opposed um, realities that developed markets are positioned uh, comparison to the emerging markets. And the last but not the least, what happened is, of course, those unprecedented measures, namely quantitative easing on steroids, as I call it, 
diverted the biggest outflows of investment from emerging markets to developed markets. Because why risk in the Philippines, Ukraine, or elsewhere if I can simply pump money in my stock market in New York or London and make government bonds or equities and make bigger money than any investment in any other emerging markets. And we have clearly see, seen it in the figures. Plus, even before the pandemic, to be honest, emerging markets, if you take the MSCI index and say S&P index, they have consistently underperformed. Meaning that starting 2012, we see a, a, a clear, not convergence, but divergence. When QE kicked in, in the EU and in the US, it has become less profitable in average to invest in the emerging markets. So at the moment, I don't think they are better positioned. On the other hand, just logically, mm -hmm. I understand that for big corporations, for any kind of business that tends to go global, it is necessary to enter new markets. And it is impossible to ignore billions of people that live in a developing world. But purely from the investment perspective, no, they are positioned much worse, unfortunately. Okay. Um before we get to the next panelist, I'm going to throw a polling question out to the audience because I want to, first of all, get you all interacting as much as possible uh, with the panel. Um, and we're also taking questions from people who are not in the room who are seeing this live streamed uh, all around the world. So the, the, the first question for you, we're going to do a couple during the course of the, the session, um, is uh, in your view, um, have emerging market economies demonstrated more resilience to COVID-19 than was initially expected. So if you can, if you can try to answer that simple yes or no question um, on, your, um, on, on, on your screens, I assume. Um, so have, have emerging market economies demonstrated more or less resilience to COVID-19 than initially expected? Um, and while we're, is that, is that result gonna come through immediately? Okay. Should I be able to see it on here? No? Okay, while that's coming through, um, I'm gonna throw this out there to um, Alvaro. Uh, can you hear me there? Oh. I can hear you, can you hear me? Excellent, perfectly. Well, you can now see the results which are coming out live on the screen. And it is looking like most people think that emerging market economies have shown more resilience um, than expected. Would you agree with that uh, assessment? And, and if so, why? I do agree with, uh, with that assessment. Uh, we just say hi to everyone, by the way, in Kiev. Sorry that I'm not there. I do agree with that assessment. However, uh, I should say that I'm more concerned about the hangover after COVID than I am right now. So I think that uh, countries have across the world uh, have utilized unprecedented um, uh, policy support and it, quite innovative policy, policy support. But we've seen across the, the developing world and across many emerging markets that, you know, contrary to what happened to many uh, advanced economies, we had lower incomes uh, going up uh, in many countries, for example, in Colombia, I'll give an example, Colombia, Incomes went down from 20 to 40 percent, depending if you're a formal or informal worker. Uh, there was also an increase in many countries of emerging markets um, net informality. There was also an increase in inequality. Um, on average, women, young people, unskilled people uh, got worse off, whereas skilled people either got better off or they were able to save and increase their disposable income. And so that's inequalities have, have risen. Not only that, there were less jobs, and in fact, more, less formal jobs, but also less informal jobs. And so I think this will have a consequence. And finally, I think we just heard uh, a major consequence going forward, and this is the hangover that I'm talking about, is the rising debt, corporate, household, and especially public debt. Even before COVID, um, institutions like ours, the World Bank and others, were quite concerned how debt was accumulating around the world, and especially in the emerging markets. And obviously, COVID just exacerbated the issue. Uh, right now, obviously, I think uh, in the short run, we are not, we're not seeing anything uh, big coming up. And there's been support from some countries. But you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about in two or three or four years when uh, the pandemic is over, 
um, there's less sympathy for emerging markets, and then it's possible they need to refinance their debts, and it's possible they'll, they'll have problems. So I'm more concerned about the medium term than I am right now. Right. Well, those, those debts will come home to roost, possibly even uh, for the rich countries. Um, can I turn to Dahlia? Dahlia, do you, how concerned should we be about the debt? How concerned should we be about the ability of emerging markets to recover from the huge blow that they took in uh, 2020? I'm happy to be here in Kiev. I have been here several years ago when there was a financial crisis in the emerging market economy. So I'm excited to see the city again and see it flourish, actually. I'm more pessimistic about the resilience and uh, the prospect of recovery for emerging economies and developing countries, and I will come to that in a minute. But I disagree with the speakers before that that is the big problem. In particular, I'm talking about public debt and not about uh, corporate debt. Um, the reason why I think that public debt is not the main issue now is because in a pandemic, it's quite natural that the government spends a lot of money and it's required to spend a lot of money because uh, the government has to compensa compensate the, 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 the contraction of the economy so that not everything falls apart. It's, it's quite natural that the government steps in in this case. And now we have a pandemic, and in the pandemic, we require public spending to fight against the pandemic, to, uh, to give uh, vaccinations for everybody, to give masks for everybody, and so on. So it's, and the third thing is, that interest rates are historically low, so financing public debt has become very cheap, and it's actually uh, the government gains from um, spending more. So it would be quite stupid for the government not to incur debt at this moment of time. But let me come to another issue, and the other issue concerns the prospects of emerging economies to recover. The pandemic had a big impact on the world economy. It changed it. And what happened is that in, in the pandemic, the global value chains uh, have, have declined. So what are global value chains? Um, you might know that the world has started to produce in global value chains since the fall of the Berlin Wall because the, rich, uh, firm, the, the firms in rich countries started to produce, to relocate production to low-wage countries like China and emerging Europe and Russia and Ukraine. So, and that helped these emerging economies to grow. So their basic growth strategy was based on being part of these global value chains that emerged after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And what happened now in the pandemic is that the there is a big uncertainty shock. People don't know whether they get the inputs from the, from the emerging um, uh, countries anymore. So these global value chains have become less profitable. Moreover, there is a, there is a, a tenfold increase in shipping cost from China, for instance, to, to Europe and to the US, tenfold increase within a year. So that makes a, a, the business model of producing in global value chains uh, not profitable. And that hits the emerging economies because basically that was where their growth was based. So I think the emerging economies have to rethink how, take, how they can grow when global value chains become less um, important. That's, that is a very good point and that's, that's very much 
in the news at the moment. I'm going to bring this to uh, Beata Harasim. Um, so the first impression that people got um, shortly after the pandemic hit was that supply chains held up really well. A lot of people were thinking, oh my gosh, because of the pandemic, uh, we're not going to see, the shops are going to be empty, you won't be able to buy toilet paper, you won't be able to buy baked beans, everyone must stock up on you know, baked beans and ammunition. Um, and that didn't happen. The, the companies that run the global supply chains turned out to be really good at their job. And there were some brief shortages in some countries, but by and large, people didn't run out of stuff. People didn't starve because of the pandemic. Nonetheless, it's clear that the supply systems are under a lot of strain. Um, and they're under a lot of strain in two ways. Firstly, just the logistics of dealing with the, 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 the pandemic. Secondly, the fact that you've now got fuel prices have really rocketed by back up. Um, and also there's this sort of sense of nervousness about, you know, can we rely on just-in-time delivery? You know, what happens if a big disaster makes it impossible for us to get, you know, uh, chips from, 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 from Taiwan uh, or uh, fuel from the places we currently get fuel? So people are a bit more nervous. I'm wondering how, how you see this, the, the global supply chain system and particularly the effect on um, emerging markets. Uh, how concerned should we be? Uh, sure, I mean, obviously supply chains uh, are changing. Uh, I completely agree with Dahlia. Um, I think that trend has even started before COVID, but COVID has um, turbocharged many of the structural trends that we knew were about to happen. This is also related to uh, China-US policy. This is related to, to the fact that many countries are turning more to onshoring than offshoring. I think this has really big implications for inflation over medium term, and that is a factor which will obviously uh, impact emerging markets as well. So I think over medium term, we can expect that uh, production costs will increase globally. And together with this um, a, a really um, unprecedented monetary policy, the new frameworks from the Fed and the ECB, which also allow for uh, higher inflation to build up over time, together with this uh, unprecedented amount of fiscal stimulus that we talked about, I think that will just lead to a higher inflation regime over medium term. Uh, that will impact developed markets, but also emerging markets. Um, and I think that is a story that will be important in terms of how emerging markets address that. I think what we have seen so far is that in many major emerging markets, we have seen central banks being preemptive and hiking interest rates, and that provided stability uh, for their currencies, or at least prevented um, deterioration in uh, our sentiment and confidence uh, around certain emerging markets. So I would add that angle to everything what we discussed so far. So growth uh, could be um, challenged in emerging markets over medium term, given all the reasons what we have said. However, more short term, I would say that we will probably see some pickup from depressed levels. Uh, inflation will remain a challenge, but we need to really see very prudent both monetary and fiscal policies, which will allow foreign investors in particular to feel confident that there is this framework of policy uh, which allow us to, to invest in emerging markets, both in, 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 in terms of private uh, investments as well as in, um, in, in assets. Um, so I would put inflation out here, and I think that is very much linked to this supply chain discussion that we started. Okay. Well, that, I mean, you mentioned inflation, you mentioned supply chains. We, we've got to ask about energy prices, right? Um, and I, I'm going to throw this one to Nicholas, okay? You, you, you invest in a wide variety of businesses, which pretty much all use energy, um, and you're in a country which, how can I put this? Um, at least one of your neighbors that supplies energy is not necessarily um, always thinking about what's best for Ukraine when it does it. You're in Ukraine, you don't have to choose words saying okay. that. You know? uh, everyone's terrified that Russia's going to cut off the supply of gas, and you know, maybe they're sort of, maybe that's overblown, maybe it's not. What, what's your perspective? Look, it is absolutely clear that in the global competition, politics and, econo and, econ and economics, they are all mixed. And they are all used 
as a tool to promote or protect one nation's interest. And Russia is not the only one doing that. And obviously, of course, they are doing that. And they haven't been actually hiding it, to be honest. Right? <laughs> everybody, everybody with open eyes and ears uh, could see that. Well, the, I, the president actually wrote an essay saying that Ukraine belongs to Russia, which is... Well, he didn't quite say that. He said that Russia and Ukraine were one people, but that's... But that's, uh, that's quite close. Right. Anyways, so the thing is, because I, I come from oil and gas, I worked for oil and gas for quite a while, and I understand the market. And uh, there always has been like the two dimensions to this market, particularly. One was long-term contracts. You want stability, you want price stability, you want supply stability, take long-term contracts. The other was let, let market do its job. So let's have stock, let's have um, open uh, spot market and let it work. And actually both system has pros and cons. What we're seeing now obviously is the, is the disadvantage, is the flip side or weakness of the spot market. When there is a shortage, when there is a deficit, prices soar. It's as simple as that. Now, will some countries use it, it, use it to their advantage? Of course, for example, we have a renewable energy business in your future, and we this year landed a landmark deal for Ukraine we attracted a strategic investor from Qatar, Nebras Power, and they bought a majority package in our uh, solar photovoltaic station portfolio. Now, they are happy about the situation at the global market with gas because they're the biggest LNG exporters, right? So, and they don't necessarily use it as uh, as same way as Russia, promoting their interests globally. So I would say that um, it only, same as COVID, would it, will do probably only uh, spearhead the trends to energy efficiency, to renewables, and to actually having balancing and mitigating factors at any given market so that like in the UK, they don't have to go for blackout because of the gas prices on the domestic market. Yes. Now, some of this, some of the energy price problem, you know, the, 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 if there's a silver lining to it, it's that it might drive uh, investment in cleaner energy and that that will be good for the the climate but it's also a function of the fact that we've already been trying to move towards cleaner energy that investments in fossil fuels are about half what they were a, a couple of years ago so there isn't the capacity uh, to meet the demand that's just uh, bounced back after the the, the COVID pandemic has um, receded in many parts of the world so I, I'm, I'm gonna throw this to, 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 to Beata um, high fuel prices and the shift to cleaner energy, is this, you know, what are the short-term and long-term effects that this is going to have on emerging markets? I mean, you know, a lot of places clearly would, would, would not benefit from, from, from climate change. One or two emerging markets, you know, one can think of the north of Russia might benefit from it. What's, what's your perspective on, on how emerging markets should handle this transition? I mean, you're obviously right that emerging market is not a homogeneous group of countries. We know there are uh, commodity exporters, especially exporters of the clean commodities, which will benefit from, from the transition, but there will be also losers. And, um, you know, you talk about the short term and long term, and I think that's very important. Short term, obviously, uh, countries exporting oil or exporting energy will benefit from the higher commodity prices, which I think are driven also due to two different factors. So, I mean, there is the restart effect, uh, which is fueling commodity prices, but then there is also this longer term structural trend and transition towards um, less carbon uh, economies. And um, I, I think, again, there will be benef beneficiaries and there will be losers. Um, we cannot really say that uh, on balance emerging markets will benefit from it or, or will lose. Uh, I think we really need to look at each country separately. And it is a, it's not an easy answer to have. Different countries have different approach to it. Um, the policies towards an environment, towards social policies are incredibly important now. Uh, but also it's about the resources that emerging markets have. And I think here, aside from China, which uh, clearly have resources to uh, turn towards more um, clean energies and, and transition towards um, net zero targets uh, by 2060, 
um, many emerging markets, uh, which are lower income countries, don't have enough resources and remain uh, unfunded in that field. And I think the, the world as a whole needs to understand that it's in our all interest. Uh, it, it's an interest of, of the whole world to help those countries to invest in the transition towards net zero, because that will obviously help the whole world. And there have been multiple studies done in terms of how much investments we need to achieve the uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, according to the um, uh, International Energy Agency, uh, the numbers are of around $1 trillion dollars. Um, every year uh, until 2030 so that we can achieve that target. So we're clearly not there. And I, and I think the message should be really clear that emerging markets need multilateral support, support from uh, wealthier countries to, to achieve that transition. Uh, and we should be observing that, that very clearly because that will also uh, then help us to, to see which countries have greater prospects of, of growth. And I think, uh, you know, COVID really helps to accelerate many trends and among them is this transition towards net zero. Um, and, and I just want to hope that, you know, it allows many countries in emerging markets to turn to this more greener, more digital, more equitable policies uh, that will really benefit those countries over medium and longer term. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna throw the next polling question out to the audience here. Um, and the question is, in your view, uh, are emerging markets well positioned to fuel the, the global recovery post COVID? Uh, and you've got the option of one, yes, two, no, and three, to some degree. So if you can ping that on your, your phones, that would be really great. And that will enable me to throw the next question to uh, Alvaro, um, where I'm gonna ask him what Okay, that's going to take a little while to warm up. Um, what, what I'm going to ask you is, what should emerging markets be doing to make their contribution to, to growth, which is obviously for their own benefit more than anybody else's? What are, what are, the, what are the two or three policy changes um, you would like to see emphasized uh, in the next year to really get growth uh, bouncing back properly? Well, thank you. Uh, but the, first, uh, the first policy is clearly vaccination. Uh, I think uh, you can see that countries that have uh, vaccinated uh, the, the, the largest amount of or percentage of their populations are the ones that are starting to recover faster. Um, and we continue to think that uh, the divergence that exists between vaccination rates across the world is one of the biggest threats, biggest risk we have going forward, but also biggest threat and biggest risk for emerging markets. So. Our advice clearly is vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate as soon as you can, so, uh, the largest pr proportion of your population that you can, so that you are able to decrease restrictions and go back to normal. This is what we want, I think, uh, uh, in our lives. Uh, second, clearly, um, you know, the, the emerging markets are going to seize the, the day regarding the, the recovery of many, emer of many advanced economies. The United States uh, economy is doing fairly okay. The, Europe is also accelerating. We have uh, Japan also doing uh, better and many parts of Asia too. And same thing for, for, for China that has been more or less on cruising speed. And so in that sense, commodity markets are going to be continue to be fairly hot, which is bad for inflation. We can talk about it a bit later. But on the other hand, it's going to be good for commodity producers. So uh, one thing that the, uh, emerging markets can offer certainly is this um, commodity-led um, uh, type of uh, recovery or exports that um, it will help them uh, circumvent some of the debt problems that we talked before, but also to go back to growth. Um, having said that, I do think, as I said, uh, emerging markets right now have to be worried not only about what I mentioned, but also, for example, uh, and related to these commodity prices, it's inflation. You can see in many countries, many emerging markets are raising their rates, some of them fairly drastically, because they are concerned what is happening to their exchange rates and what is happening also to, um, you know, uh, what will happen with the, with the recovery and especially with the tapering in, in countries like the United States. And so what we think it is quite important, um, it's exactly that uh, pay attention uh, what will happen to inflation, because inflation around the world, more inflation would mean higher rates, high interest rates. High interest rates means High, more difficult to pay debts for households, for firms, and for and for or for um, um, 
states as well, for, for countries. And so as a consequence, this is going to be a major, major issue. So even though I think that many things are going on the favor of emerging markets, uh, like commodity exporting, uh, and also the policy support of many advanced economies, um, I think the big thing, the priority should be vaccination. The second priority should be uh, be careful with your macro stability because the next uh, few uh, years are going to be rocky ones. Are not going to be are going to be vulnerable. Some countries are going to be vulnerable, and they are going to be volatile at times ahead. Okay. Now I'm going to ask two brief questions, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience and to the people watching remotely to ask questions to any of the panelists. So if you can either do that by sending them in to the app, or you can raise your hand when I ask shortly. Um, so where are we? To some degree, we think that emerging markets are positioned to help fuel the global recovery, um, with 23% uh, of people saying, no, they're not. Um, and 32% quite positive and saying, yes, they are. Um, so let, let me ask Dalia, what, what would your prescriptions be um, for emerging markets in general and, and for Ukraine in particular? Uh, before I come to an answer to that question, I would write, like to um, comment on Beate's uh, comment about inflation. Sure. Um, it's true that uh, now uh, there is a big uh, uh, worry because of the supply disruption that we will see more inflation. And basically there, are, there, there is a debate among economists whether this inflation threat is transitory or permanent. And I would like to, like to say that the rich countries, the, 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 the high income countries, basically they have responded to the disruption of global value chains by investing in robots. So because they have been investing in robots, and these robots have been automating workers, it is very unlikely that the disruption of supply chains are going to lead to more inflation in the medium and long term, because basically rich, the, 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 countries in, in, uh, the firms in rich countries have started to invest in robots. And that brings me now to the emerging economies that you, um, do, that you focused on. So what should an emerging economies do to uh, navigate in this new environment? And I think that they should do exactly what the rich countries have been doing, namely technology, to invest in robots. Now, actually, in my research, I looked at emerging economies in Europe, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, Czech Republic. When you look at these countries, Poland, when you look at these countries, you see that these countries have invested in robots. And the reason why they have invested in robots is because they had a brain drain. So many of, uh, in, in, in many of these countries, workers have left to Europe, actually, to Germany and the UK. And so they had a big brain drain and they have a shortage of labor. And so they were forced to invest in robots because of this. And so what you see is in these emerging economies, they have more robots per thousand of workers than the US. And so they were able, because of, the, of this investment, they were able to avoid what a, a development economists call the middle income trap. Uh, they could grow and become rich countries if you want so. So uh, my prescription is that emerging economies should start to invest in robots and that will help them to increase their productivity, to keep labor costs low, and, and so to grow. And the other prescription is probably if you see a further retreat in globalization, uh, some of these countries will need to think about regionalism, to think about how they can export more to neighboring countries rather than um, to faraway countries. Okay. Um, 
Right, so if anyone would like to ask a question to one of the panellists, if you can raise your hand, uh, and I will recognise you, and someone will bring you a microphone, I think. So, um, and I'm also going to read out one of the, the questions from the uh, audience who are watching remotely. So I'm actually going to start with that. Um, the question is, uh, it seems that uh, information technology workers have been largely unaffected by COVID-19 restrictions because they're able to um, work wherever they like. Do you think that this is going to be a, a permanent state of affairs and, and how do you think that's going to affect emerging markets? Maybe if I throw that one to Nicholas, would you like to take that one? Sure. Well, it's just been debated at the previous panel right at this stage about the future of work and leadership. And uh, I think I would not be original saying that uh, most probably a mixed way of digital nomads and office workers or remote workers uh, would be our new normal in the future uh, because uh, there, there, is, there is some types of work that requires creativity and creative, being creative alone in the room uh, mostly is impossible. It requires human interaction, it requires uh, personal interaction and chemistry among people. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of technical repetitive uh, assignments or jobs, the types of, even in the information technology field, that probably could be done remotely uh, mostly. And, I, and you know what, the same as uh, with all the trends that COVID has accelerated, actually being a digital nomad was not something that COVID invented. This trend of a growing number of people around the world who are not tied physically to any single country or city has been growing and COVID only accelerated, uh, accelerated this but change. It accelerated it a lot, right? It is accelerated a lot, but once again, you know, it is, so w I think what we have all to differentiate is how we respond to a crisis and how we live sustainably. W what I mean is that everybody was very excited that when suddenly the entire world went on lockdown last year, people managed to work from home. And surprise, surprise, in some cases, the, the um, uh, effectiveness actually and productivity even increased, but people forget that it was for a relatively short period of time. That was for two, three, five months. This is first. Secondly, that was due to the fact that most of the world was on a severe lockdown, meaning there was nothing else you could do. In some countries, you could not even walk on the street freely unless you were going to a drugstore or to see a doctor. So, of course, people would sit home and, of course, they would work, be it IT professionals or not. Now, can you really build a core any culture, or again, corporate culture, organization culture, can you build a personal relationship sitting at home online via Zoom? I doubt it very much. So um, th that's why, again, not being original, there's going to be some sort of a mix that we will see in the future. And by the way, may I piggyback a little bit on public debt, which you said? Uh, I, I really would like you to send this message to IMF and other financial institutions that have been stifling countries with, like Ukraine about public debt, that it's normal to increase it, especially in times like COVID, and not to decrease it to receive another tranche. I would really appreciate it, as the Ukrainian, just as a citizen, not as a business person. Well, actually, the IMF is saying that the reason why the, the, the high-income countries have been doing so much better during the pandemic relative to the emerging countries and developing countries is exactly because of public uh, expenditures. Because in the high-income countries, public expenditures exploded. Look at the United States. Public expenditure exploded, even in Germany. While in the emerging economies, you start already to withdraw. So the reason why the forecast for next years in the emerging economies is so weak is exactly because the government starts to reduce its public expenditures. So the IMF is not prescribing for emerging economies to stop, uh, to stop um, 
to, to stop government uh, expenditure. I, I think Nicholas well, might well, want what to... What IMF is doing, effectively, is prescribing emerging economies, Ukraine in particular, to meet certain macroeconomic uh, KPIs or thresholds which do not absolutely allow countries like Ukraine to increase public debt since they directly prohibit countries like Ukraine to increase public debt. On the other hand, they demanded to decrease public debt for us to receive the next portion of the tranche. So what is allowed to the United States in Europe is not allowed to the emerging markets in the eyes of IMF. That's pretty accurate. Um, can I move on? First of all, anyone who wishes to raise? Yes, there's a, a hand there at the back. Can someone get him a microphone? Um, the gentleman over there. We have, and if you want to say who you are and maybe which of the panelists you'd like to address your question to. Thank you. Vladislav uh, Danleko, your future. Uh, my question is, what weight do you give to the drastic vaccine inequity? Uh, on the chances, on the prospects of, uh, of recovery of emerging markets, if any. Okay, um, perhaps um, Alvaro, would you like to take that one? Did you... I can talk about it, I can, okay, thank you. Um, well, this is a, a very important point, you know, but I give an example without even talking about the recovery, just to see the perspective and what is the difference uh, in many, many emerging markets. Think about Latin America. In Latin America, you had the longest, um, uh, not only lockdowns, but also school closures um, of any part of the world. And so uh, there's a huge inequity uh, around the world, even just about school closures. And which means in many parts of the world, some kids had zero classes for a year. This will lead to a substantial increase, uh, likely of school dropouts, and uh, it's also inequality is going forward in, uh, in these countries. But also, many of these countries will have um, skills that are not as good because partly of the school closures. And so, coming back to you, uh, so obviously, if you maintain low rates of vaccination, if you have no access to vaccination, or if you have very low rates of vaccination, that means that we've seen throughout the last two years that we are going to have, unfortunately, more waves of the virus coming, you know? This virus can be more virulent, can be more contagious. It can be less, we don't know. You know, in previous pandemics, you know, these waves, it, it depends on the mutations, on the variants, so we'll see. But we know that on average, uh, if countries don't vaccinate, that means that they will have to impose more restrictions uh, be, so that they don't, don't have problems with their healthcare and the rest of the economy. So, obviously that will uh, slow down the recovery. And so this is why what we say that the most important policy right now is vaccination all around the world, as fast as you can, uh, and with the largest portion of the population that you can. Okay, uh, but I mean, because it's, 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 it's partly a question of vaccine inequity, it's partly a question of the vaccines not being available, but it's also partly a question of people being amazingly unwilling to take the most extraordinary medical advance of the, of, of the current century. Why, why is that happening? Why are people not taking their vaccines? Why is it not happening in Ukraine? Nicholas, do you want to tell us? Well, I'm not, I'm not a government representative, so I probably cannot give you the full picture. I can only give my personal point of view. You're a concerned that, right? citizen, right? Right, right. But so first of all, we didn't have it available. Of course, uh, I mean, but it, this is for a very short period of time. I'm talking first half of 2021, when there was a competition among the world to get it first. And of course, Ukraine was not among the first, uh, even dozens of countries that were in the line to get it first. Uh, and richest countries have got it first, surprise, surprise. I don't know why or how it happened, but somehow it happened exactly like that, right? Then Ukraine and now we have, as far as I'm concerned, plenty of vaccines of all kinds, uh, Sinovac and Pfizer and Moderna and anything you can get your hands on. But there's, there's a question about, um, first of all, infrastructure because uh, no country in the world and Ukraine among them was prepared for this kind of event, even though uh, smart people like Bill Gates were talking about this long time ago. Uh, the, there's not sufficient infrastructure, vaccination points, etc. And of course, there is this hesitance among public, uh, which I cannot explain, to be honest, because why otherwise smart and rational people would not even be afraid of death, of 
their own life and uh, their loved ones when they take vaccines all their life and especially in the, in the Soviet Union uh, and, and after the Soviet Union there was a mandatory vaccination for everybody for all toddlers for all kids for all school kids every year when I went to school my kids went to school you could not get into start a new school year without vaccines it was absolutely but this specific vaccine against this specific disease for some reason causes huge doubts and speculation but I think my personal opinion I think it's another uh, tool of hybrid warfare because why attack countries? Why uh, do some economic sabotage if you can spread very cheaply through social media and other available tools? And we know what social media does lately. It actually exaggerates all the conflicts and uh, controversial things. So you can use the, this method to actually undermine other countries' well-being by exactly as our colleagues, fellow panelists say, by not by spreading lies about vaccination, people are becoming hesitant, their economic growth, and in general, capacity as a nation declines significantly. Okay. So I think it's a combination of factors. Okay, well, that's a, a very foolish um, uh, weapon, given the vaccine, you know, the, 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 the pandemic blows back, and if it's in one place, it's gonna come back to wherever, wherever you are when you when it's you a foolish, it. It's a foolish thing to do if you think- it Doesn't uh, mean it's not happening. If but. you care about your population, okay? If you yeah. think that human beings are invaluable, uh, there are countries who do not consider human beings, even their own, to be invaluable and ready to sacrifice them for higher political goals. Okay, that's a worrying thought. It's a question down, down here. Um, so there's two people in a line, the one okay. slightly closest to me and then the second one. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Marco Jamal, coming from Turkey Council, a new regional organization. Its members are Turkey, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. My question is for Ms. Dalia Marin. In his uh, speech, he, she mentioned about uh, a retreat in global trends, a retreat in globalization, so, and talk about uh, uh, the regionalization. We can talk about maybe in regionalization, an increase of intra-trade among the members of certain economic blocks or regional co uh, organization. Could you elaborate on this fact, please? Talia. Uh, yeah. When you look at the development, um, what you see is basically, for instance, in emerging Europe, these countries have been exporting the inputs within supply chains, in particular to Europe. So Germany was a hub. So what happens is probably, so this is a prediction that I'm giving. I think that firms have three ways uh, to respond to um, the shock of the pandemic to make supply chains more resilient. One way is to reshore production back to their own market uh, produce the input yourself as a firm or to let a, a, a domestic input supplier produce it. But the other way is to diversify your inputs to other countries. So for example, a German firm might decide to reshore um, re the input from China and bring it to emerging Europe, you see what I mean? So the region, the regional hub between Germany and emerging Europe might expand because of this. So the emerging European countries might be a more secure location for these value chains because they are closer by and there is a less likely that there is a disruption because there is less of a distance. You, you have to understand that the future uncertainty is not only about pandemics, it's also about climate risk. So for instance, the shortage in, in the chips, they were started by a severe drought in Taiwan because this Taiwanese firm that is a dominant player in the chips market has, has closed its, its factory. So the whole, the whole world was suffering, in particular in the auto sector. 
So what, what that means, so a response to that was that the European Union has decided to start its own uh, chip sector and battery cell sector in Europe, and Europe includes, of course, the emerging European countries. And so what, what I expect is that these, in this, the, 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 the diversification need of rich countries will help emerging Europe, including Ukraine, actually. Um, so there will be a stronger regional hub uh, than it was before. Okay, can we have a question from the gentleman behind you? Thank you for your amazing discussion. And uh, my question is basically on this uh, regionalization topic. So you mentioned that the Europe hub will benefit from this. However, uh, the com uh, countries like, you know, in Southeast Asia, like Taiwan that you mentioned, China and other countries, they will actually suffer. And don't you think that it might lead to a crisis in the emerging markets since we already have, you know, our supply chain is disrupted and therefore we might get into further crisis as for those countries that are export oriented. Thank you. Um, you know, when you look at China, you see that China has already changed its business model of development. They started to uh, uh, reshore production back to China from the other Asian countries, actually, from India, Vietnam, and so on. They reshore Japan. They reshored back to their home market. So the Chinese have, an, have a new model to be less dependent on exports and more dependent on the domestic economy. So China has been doing this already before the pandemic, and they are certainly going to uh, continue it, in particular because they will see that the reshoring is happening, that the rich countries are bringing back their supply chains to their domestic market or to Europe. And then the other thing is that uh, you know, because of the competition in technology between China and the U.S., China also tried to become more independent in its technology. So that's the another reason why China is, 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 is turning more inwards rather than more outwards. So this is a tendency that you have been seeing already before the pandemic and it will continue. Okay, we're gonna try a couple of very quick fire questions. I'm gonna take one from the online audience and then I'm gonna to come to the gentleman there and I'm gonna ask the respondents to, to answer sort of fairly briefly. So the, the online question which, which I'd like to pose to Beata, if you're okay with that, um, is how can the most uh, fossil fuel dependent economies such as Russia and the Gulf states diversify away from that? Really swiftly, how would you answer that? Ah, we can't hear you. Uh, hope you can hear me now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Great. Great. Uh, so I think obviously investing in renewable sources of energy. Uh, Saudi Arabia is already trying to do that. I think Russia should also spend more efforts uh, doing that. So transitioning from uh, fossil fuel intensive uh, sectors and industries into the greener energy. Okay. That's a great answer. Um, and. The gentleman down there, can someone give him a microphone? Do you have a microphone? You have one, brilliant. What's your question, sir? Um, uh, my question is uh, about uh, Green Deal uh, investments. Uh, when we talk about emerging markets, uh, we discuss here only commodities or any trade relations, but when we talk about the uh, possible investments to modernize uh, Ukrainian economy. The calculations say uh, Ukrainian economy needs uh, from 50 to 200 billion dollars. Um, and in fact, until now, uh, Ukraine is uh, somewhere in the outskirts of European Union. And uh, there was a promise to have a green fund from Germany of one billion dollars, which is uh, absolutely not enough. So when we think about the possibility of trade between Ukraine and, uh, and European Union as a main partner in the future, 
that would be all the time negative balance. So my question is that, do you think uh, it is really possible to talk something about real figures and then it will boost uh, the economy because the economy is uh, quite dependent on the emissions of CO2 and other emissions? Is it really possible to talk about that? Because now, until now we see that European Union in, announced about uh, uh, around 1 trillion euros of investments, uh, also 80% from the budget, but uh, we see here only the promises of $1 billion from Germany. Okay, and is that addressed to one particular member of the panel? I mean, I can ask Alvaro, he hasn't spoken for a while, and I'm sure he has strong views on this. Yeah, yeah I, I think this is to our online speakers. Okay, Alvaro. Well, I, I think certainly there are great opportunities for Ukraine going forward. I, I, I really think Ukraine uh, can play a very important role, not only in the region, but also uh, increasing trade with the European Union. For me, the most important thing about Ukraine uh, certainly can seize the opportunity of the New Deal and the, uh, the Green Deal. But, but I think uh, the pandemic opens the opportunities as well for Ukraine, either the, with the, the new onshoring that you're going to have. So there will be a, a lot of uh, uh, industries that might uh, want to relocate and Ukraine might be attractive. Um, and also because of the pandemic, uh, the, the, the impulse with digitalization, which is going to help, uh, especially uh, your IT ser uh, services and other services that could, uh, in which you have quite a lot of uh, uh, people there, so uh, doing the, the working on the sector, so it might be a good possibility. But I think most importantly, uh, going forward, uh, as I think Nicholas was saying, okay, let's let's not focus so much on fiscal. The, the focus in the next few years should be for the recovery. How can you improve the business climate in Ukraine? That's a crucial thing, so that you bring more not only European but other international investment, either green um, or, or or some sort of a, a green uh, infrastructure as well. That's an excellent answer. So I'm going to go through the panelists one by one. To, oh, sorry, was there one more question down there? We'll give you one more question. Um, do you have a microphone? It's coming. If you could introduce yourself as well, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Andrei Tsimbal, a managing partner of KPMG in Ukraine. Um, my question, I will address uh, the panel um, and maybe uh, you know, Nikolai or international guests. Uh, the question is about how um, a shortage of talents uh, affect uh, ability of emerging markets to develop. Because we know in Ukraine that's a big problem. Uh, there is a brain uh, drain. Uh, people live into Europe uh, to higher, you know, prospects, higher salaries. This is increases the costs, uh, shortage of talents in Ukraine, and uh, the companies, businesses generally do not cope well of passing these increases to their customers. So I think that's for Ukraine definitely a big problem. Um, so any reflections whether it's a widespread issue for emerging markets where people are leaving, the talents are in the short supply, and how, uh, how to deal with that? Thank you. Well, Nicholas, you deal with this firsthand. Maybe you could tell us. Well, yes. Well, you cannot stop braid drain from anywhere except North Korea, probably. So uh, you have to create conditions and environment when those talents want to stay and foster those talents. That's what projects like Unit City is about, you know, creating conditions and environment for, start, uh, for talents to flourish and want to stay in a, in a given country. And I think it's a, it, in any case, it's a you know, very natural um, a trend that happens throughout the world when uh, people want to migrate and want to explore opportunities in better countries. I think there is a positive for that in Ukraine because a lot of successful Ukrainians abroad not only come back, but actually come back with uh, starting more businesses in Ukraine, with exploring their Ukrainian heritage and opportunities that are still in Ukraine to actually reinforce their global businesses, which is again bringing Ukraine onto the global map, including Ukraine in global value chains. All of it is beneficial for our country. But other than creating conditions in our country that would entice and incentivize people to stay. There's no way of keeping them inside. It's true for Ukraine as well as for probably any other country in the world. I mean, it's, people have a, a strong tendency to remain where they were born because that's where their family are, that's where they understand the language, that's where they, you know, everything is familiar. So within the European Union, any, any member of the European Union, which alas, no longer includes me, uh, so I'm from Britain, but um, has a right to live and work freely in any other country. 
And if it were a simple economic question, then you might expect the entire population of Greece to move to Germany because wages are much higher in Germany, but they don't. Right, but there's a, so there's a certain age group that is prone to that. We're talking about uh, not even teenagers, we're talking about people who usually don't have any equity assets or family commitments and actually open to exploring life. And very often, to be honest, alert by the showbiz images of, say, the United States, right? that uh, actually exploring that and because the global pop well not the global but the developed world population same true for eastern europe is actually getting older uh you see yes there are more people who are tend who tend to say stay in their given country because of everything what you said but it's not true for the young people it's not true for the teenagers or people who just out of the university or even going to have an education abroad sure but many of them move and do better and good luck to them and some of them move learn new skills make new contacts and move back to the place they were from and set up companies there which is pretty much where the whole in them, indian yeah. it system uh, eco ecosystem came from um dalia you wanted to jump in there we have yeah, one awesome. minute left so it's got to be really quick so this is very interesting because the ukrainians are actually emigrating to poland because poland is a boom town and they have a shortage of labor. So many of the Ukrainians and the, the, the Polish government is trying to get them. So a big brain drain comes from Bola. It comes from the Polish government trying to get the Ukrainians. But it's very interesting that Ukraine and Russia were the countries which have been the most highly skilled population. So the, the, the share of people with an academic degree in math and in in, in a tech uh, grade is largest in, in uh, compared to Germany, for instance, is largest in Ukraine and in Russia. So these locations have become very interesting places to invest because of the talent. So I do agree with uh, the, 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 the person from the audience that the, if this is not happening anymore, or be, because people go away from the Ukraine, this is a big disadvantage in, in further development. So you should try to see whether you can give an incentive for these people to stay in Ukraine. But let's not forget we still have, thanks to that, strong math school and booming IT sector, 20, 30% growth of IT sector per year, both in headcount and in volume. And it's already, I think, in top five export businesses of Ukraine in general, even comparing to products. And, it's, and thanks to specifically this sector, unlike in products, in services, Ukraine has a positive trade saldo because it's export more services. Thank you so much. We are pretty much out of time there, but we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and what have we concluded? That essentially you need to do the things to keep the talent, to stroke the talent, to make them come back. These are pretty much the things you'd need to do anyway. Govern well, have peace, have prosperity, you know, um, treat people fairly, have less corruption. Those are all the kinds of things that countries need. And of course, vaccinate the talent so it doesn't die before it can start doing great things for us. And that's, that is the big question. So um, I'd like to end there by saying thank you very much to Dalia, to Nicholas, to Alvaro, and to Beata. And thank you very much uh, the audience for joining us both here and online. Um, there's going to be a break now, um, and there's another session here uh, in one hour's time, so, um, which is on uh, healthcare. And gosh, I think we might mention COVID-19 during that. So thank you all very much indeed. And if you could join me <laughs> applauding our panelists. Thank you.